Welcome to Ignite Your Confidence for women in leadership who want to speak up and stand out. I'm your host, Karen Laus. Here you'll get all of the tips and tools that you need to stand out with unshakable confidence. Let's dive into today's episode. All right. Well, this is such a thrill to be with my niece, Becca Hoppiger, and I'm excited to talk all things confidence with you, Becca. But as I love to do, I love to have my guests introduce themselves. So would you tell us about who you are? Yeah, happily. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I'm super excited. Aunt Karen, this is great. <laughs> um, only only how five people in the world get to call you Aunt Karen, right? Uh, well, yeah. no, then on Chris's side too, on your husband's side. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but I've never no. had somebody on my podcast call me Aunt Karen. <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. I've yeah. got it first. Great. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I am not only your niece, I'm also uh, the senior reporter at ABC 10 News. That's the ABC affiliate in Sacramento, California. Um, and as the senior reporter, I not only do all the things that people see of TV news reporters going live from the scene and breaking news and live out in the snow, uh, but also I work on some deeper dive content that isn't necessarily tied to news of the day, um, but that kind of just delves into important topics that people um, you know, might find really interesting, but that in the average newscast, they might not dedicate the time to uh, dive deep into. So it's a new show that's going to be launching uh, later this year. I'm super excited for that. So um, a little bit of your traditional news reporting work and then a little bit of, um, you know, some, some long form projects, which I'm very excited about. And I've been reporting on TV news stations across the country for the last decade, for the most part, the better part of the last decade, um, starting in Iowa, and then my reporting career took me to Knoxville, Tennessee, and then here to Sacramento, California, which is great because I'm just an hour and a half or five hours, depending on if there's a crash on I-80, uh, away from <laughs> you and my beloved aunts and uncles in San Francisco. Oh, that's so great. Well, I love watching everything that you do. You have such quality work and you've done it since you were a kid. What I'm curious about is did you always have the confidence that you have now? I certainly think that my confidence in reporting has grown. I think I've always had a natural inclination toward theatrics and communication and the stage, you know, growing up doing plays and musicals, you know, starting on my parents' mantle place by the fire and by the fireplace. And then, you know, in, throughout middle school and high school and so forth. But in terms of, um, you know, journalism, there's just like a higher level of, of um, requirements. Certainly, it's it's there. There are not only ethical standards, but you have to get your facts right, and you have to learn about uh, the best best practices for gathering those facts and how to treat your sources ethically and fairly, um, and how to tell a story in a balanced, uh, responsible way. So those are all things I was you know, lucky to learn at a good school, University of Missouri, Mizzou, their school of journalism. Um, but when you go out into the real world and you get that first big girl job, 40 hours a week, full-time reporting, you know, that's, that's really where um, the on-the-job training comes. And so I think in that regard, job experience, just good old-fashioned 40 hour a week, day in and day out reporting and getting those reps in with the live shots, with the stories, with the quick turn deadlines, uh, that has allowed my confidence to grow and just seeing the fruits of that labor and that practice and, and seeing and hearing feedback from the people whose stories I get to tell saying that they feel I had, you know, conveyed their, their story well, or, um, you know, made, made them taught them something. Um, Cause you know, when you're a general assignment reporter, your uh, assignments can range from covering the city council meeting, maybe some hot button topic, to telling the story of a parent who lost a child, um, you know, uh, overseas um, or um, to a traffic, a, a fatal traffic crash. I mean, just we're there for some of the worst moments of people's lives and some of the best moments of people's lives. So uh, I guess I'll wrap this answer by saying uh, I've also grown in confidence in empathy and how to um, how to talk to people, but more importantly, listen during mm -hmm. really emotional moments that they let me in on and, and share with me. Hmm. Well, that speaks a lot to your character as well. And the way that you come across that you create that safe space for people that feel comfortable talking to you. you. And that's a, a very special thing about you in general, not just your professional life. Can we go personal for a little bit about your confidence? 
Sure, go for it. I would love to know as a woman, I'm thinking about, so professionally, I get that. How about some from a personal perspective, have you always felt confident or more importantly, have you had any self-doubt? Oh gosh, I mean, certainly. And I don't know, I think about, I was a child raised in the 90s and I, I just, you know, I can't talk about my confidence as a woman without talking about just the, the body image issues that I think a lot of women of all generations and all ages struggle with, have struggled with, continue to struggle with. Um, and I think about some of the icons of the 90s. I mean, the most salient go-to actress in my mind is is Callista Flockhart, you know, just just <laughs> just these real thin arms and no body shaming of her, but those were the type of images that I saw. And as a big boned, corn fed Midwestern girl who I, you know, and I own that now, you know, I like my height and I like that I, I have a, a, a taller, bigger, strong physique. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, I mean, I did not fit into that thin um, movie star aesthetic that I grew up seeing on TV and in magazines. Um, and so uh, I think there has been a long journey of, um, kind of processing that and coming to love, as I said, uh, my strength and my size and, and what my body can do versus looking at what it maybe isn't or what it can't do. You know, I'll never be this type of body figure, but that doesn't mean that I can't love what I, what I was born with. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think my confidence has grown in just coming to accept and love myself. And um, um, yeah, and, and I think that as also a journey and I'm, you know, a big fan of, of therapy and that has helped me through, you know, kind of processing some body image issues from, you know, my childhood and teen years. Um, and yeah, just kind of talking it out, working it out and, and learning that I'm not the only one. There are a lot, a lot of women uh, have that same journey and the same struggle in their past. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that's the big thing that I love to you just being willing to share about it because it's important to share these things so that we do know that we're not alone because sometimes it can definitely feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering when you were a kid, what was your favorite thing to do for fun? Oh my goodness. Well, I love to do a lot of things, but the first thing that came to mind was I was lucky enough to live on a, a cul-de-sac, like a street with a cul-de-sac, so like a long extended street uh, so not, not through traffic, um, with like four or five other girls right around my age. And, uh, you know, I feel like I grew up in this perfect small window of, of generation where, um, I had that beautiful pre-internet childhood, you know, where, yeah, sure. I, I watched TV and cartoons and all that, but you know, I didn't have a, a phone or, or I didn't, you know, there's no, uh, Instagram, no Facebook. Um, but then the internet came of age as I did. And so I got to learn and get on board and kind of learn those skills that I'm, you know, that we all, most of us use in our, in our daily jobs and lives. Um, so anyway, all of that said, when I was a kid, we were still running around in the neighborhood, building forts in the woods, growing up in, you know, suburban Minnesota, we were in kind of a very woodsy area with a lake in our backyard. And so there was no shortage of trees and fields to run through and, and make believe in and riding our bikes up and down the, the, you know, the street into the cul-de-sac. And yeah, I just had a really good time with uh, the other girls on the street. And I think that was, um, yeah, I'm actually, one of them is my best friend to this day. Um, and uh -huh. I got to watch her raise her kids and um, see them play with they, their neighbor kids. Oh, that is so, that's so great. Such fun memories. Well, going back for a moment of what you said earlier, I love that you were talking about owning your body as it is and mm -hmm. seeing it as strength. Was there a moment, and if so, can you drop us into the moment where you felt like you owned it? You kind of woke up and went, I'm owning this. Or was it a gradual progression or something else? Yeah, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I had this opportunity that was just really such a gift when I was a reporter in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, there was this opportunity to partner with basically these as kind of a uh, documenting my journey. And so as a reporter, getting to partner with these two trainers uh, in town mm -hmm. and um, kind of go through like a fitness journey. And um, I played softball growing up, but I was never, I, when it came time to choose between like this, like the school path of like serious, you know, high school athletics or high school theater, 
I picked theater. So I never really played sports in a really organized way where you're, where you're going to the gym every day with your team. You know what I mean? I just kind of played community softball, slow pitch. Yeah. And so, <laughs> um, you know, I was athletic growing up, but not in the way that my high school peers who were in athletics, like in, in the form of program were. Um, so anyhow, it was my first time really where I was doing that kind of like intense, concerted physical training. And it was really cool just to see the way my body responded. And I, um, I'm just very grateful because I know it was, it was a really um, great opportunity to work with these knowledgeable trainers and um, just kind of see and, and just learn, I mean, learn exercises and learn things about how to, you know, treat my body that I, that I take to this day. Um, and then boy, I, we, we worked together for, I think it was like six months and I documented the journey. And then when we got to six months, uh, I think both I and the female trainer was a husband wife duo. We both said, you know, there's, there's a, there's like a physique competition, like a bodybuilding competition coming up in three months in Nashville, which was three hours away from Knoxville, where, where we lived and worked. And so she said, do you want to just continue on? And then we'll compete in this. So I was like, oh my gosh, what a crazy, sure. I have to say yes to this. <laughs> so anyway, I was in like a bodybuilding competition in like the smallest little bikini and like super spray tanned. And it was just so surreal, something I never could have seen myself doing. And, you know, I realized from the outside, I always looked at those and I thought, oh my gosh, like it's kind of, kind of a, kind of a weird world, you know, but once I was in it, I realized it, it really, it's, it's these are athletes, you know, um, and it takes a lot to, um, and I want to, I want to put a caveat there to say that even at the, even at the time, uh, we, you know, and the trainers were good at conveying this to me, but I knew how I looked then was not, that was not sustainable. We, we are cutting weight. We we're getting down for the sure. competition. That's not my idealized, like, wow, I wish I could look like that always. Cause that was not <laughs> sustainable, but to your point, your question was, you know, did, when did you learn about your body's strength? And I would say that that journey really helped me learn about my strength. And so since then, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel like I can't be alone in this, that like, you know, body image goes like this. It's not like, Oh, I have confidence and it's perfect forever. You know, like, right. exactly. So, you know, I did put on weight after that competition. I mean, you know, there's only, there's only weight to gain. And when you're, when you're so, you know, uh, trimmed down. And so, you know, I had trouble kind of adjusting to that, but the whole point is that I, I think I've kind of come to the stasis now where, um, I say, yeah, I've put on some weight, but you know what? I, I'm, uh, working out regularly. I like feeling, um, that strength that I feel like I'm honoring my body. Mm. Um, and a lot of that comes from knowing that, uh, how good that felt, not the trimming down, but the building strength and harnessing that strength and seeing that put functionally into my work. When I would be say carrying around my, you know, I have a tripod, a big tripod that I log a big camera bag. Sometimes, you know, if I'm trekking in the snow for a live shot, yeah, I, there's, there's a very physical aspect to, um, some days of reporting and, um, being in shape helps me there. So it's not just about looking good. Of course, it's about feeling good and being able to go around in this world uh, more efficiently. Well, and I remember that so vividly because I remember going, oh my gosh, look at what she did. I mean, the whole thing was so incredible and bringing people into your journey was so incredible to watch. Just amazing. Also the power of the human body the yeah. flexibility that we have and the ability to, to, like you said, like trim down, but just have you had so much muscle on you too. And, and I love the acknowledgement that it's like, you get down to a certain point, there's really only weight to gain yes. Yes. and how hard that would be for any of us. And obviously we have to think about what kind of life do we want to have? Do we want to have quality of life and eat good food and not be at the gym constantly either? Or do you want to be eating white fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For those like last two weeks, it was just the leanest protein. It was like 0% Greek yogurt. It was egg whites. It was like certain vegetables and white fish. And oh my God, I got really creative with the spices. Okay, a little bit of salt and then some like some pepper to really spice up this white fish. Anyway, so yes, not at all sustainable at all. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, in thinking about your whole life, I know this is the whole, your whole life, a big question, but I would love to know what the best advice is that you've ever received. Ooh, goodness gracious. There's, I mean, there's a great journalism uh, faculty member at Mizzou who I often refer back to when it comes to lessons learned, uh, you know, in, in reporting. Um, 
uh, and so I guess the, one of my favorites that comes to mind is uh, he said, you know, in your first job, um, you're going to make your lifelong friends and you're going to make some of your biggest mistakes. And that's where you want, you want to make those mistakes in your first, in TV news, we call it your first market. Um, oh, really? It's, there's a yeah. name for it? Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, a market is like, um, it's the, the whole country is split up into markets and it all comes down to kind of how many people, population size. So New York is the largest market, LA, Chicago. Um, uh, and so, you know, your first market is going to be something like, you know, market 150 or market, you know, I mean, there are little places in Podunkville, USA that are, it's market 200 something. So anyhow, your, your first market is where you're going to really cut your teeth. You're going to work the hardest because there are going to be the fewest resources. Um, so you might have to run your own live shots, which there's a whole conversation about the safety of that, but I'll, I'll put that to the side for now. But, um, you know, uh, and you might be in some challenging situations or because you're new on the job, you might make a factual error or you might make a, an, an ethical misjudgment just because you don't have that experience. So uh, if you learn from it and if you make the appropriate corrections, um, you know, you, you will only grow, but you can't make those kinds of mistakes uh, in the big leagues. Um, and so I think something really important also that I learned, sorry, my dog's whining down there. Um, something that I, important that I learned was, um, uh, you know, if you, come here, buddy, can I introduce him? Yes, of course you can. This is Aww, it's campy. So for those of you, most of you are are listening to this and not seeing it, but Becca yes. has a new darling rescue dog. Yes. He's like a cute little scruffy looking chihuahua of some kind, but anyway, <laughs> so I'm just going to pick him up and pet him out of, out of frame while so he'll stop whimpering. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it's that, um, there was a, I wanted, there's, there was a big market. There's, I wanted, you know, I wanted to work in M Minneapolis. That, that's, you know, the market where I grew up and yeah. uh, there's a station there that I really love. And, uh, and uh, I had some great advice from a mentor who said, you know, we had someone that he worked at the station and he said, we had someone who, um, who worked here. Uh, and she, um, she came here from a really small market. She kind of got not lucky. I mean, she earned it. She's a good reporter, but like she made a big leap from a very small okay. market, to this market. And he said, um, he's like, she had shared this with me. And he's like, and she would tell you this too. He said, she, if she could go back and do it over again, she would have at least one market in between because she felt she mm -hmm. kind of became this big market. And she felt like not only was she feeling a little bit like a small fish in a big pond, but other people in the newsroom saw her as a small fish in a big pond. So she had to bend over backwards to prove herself, which is something that I think women uh, in, uh, you know, in general, probably face a lot and it depends on which industry you're in as well. But, um, there is something to be said perhaps about, um, in terms of confidence, gaining the experience you need, whatever that might look like for, you, for any individual person, um, before getting to a place, I guess, I, I guess I don't want to make it sound like, you know, wait your turn or like, don't shoot for the moon. But yeah. if you want to shoot for the moon, you want to feel like, okay, I, I can back up um, what I'm promising or what I'm shooting for with skills. So it's that mix of confidence, but the confidence that's backed by, um, you know, deliverables or experience. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Well, it makes me think about when I first left the corporate world to start my own business was many years ago, 2003. And I didn't know what I was doing and I, I did it. But I ended up going back to corporate and there's a whole other story for that. But the second time I left, which was July, 2020, I was so much more equipped and I'm mm. so clear on my mission. Mm. So I'm immediately connecting with that as well, because I do think that a huge part of it is jumping smart to wh whatever the next thing is. And I'm a big believer in just jumping in. And at the same time, it's what's going to set you up for success. And you know, just like you said, her feeling like it sounds like she probably had to jump through more hoops than she might have had if she had had another X amount of years somewhere else. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense to me. Yeah. 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 Definitely. What's the best and or your what's your favorite story that you've ever done? Oh my gosh. I've I've had so many cool opportunities. Um I mean, I think one of my favorites, there's different topics, right? There's there's like a there's like wow, I had the opportunity to like interview this high profile political candidate because they were coming through Iowa stumping for the, because I was the first in the nation caucus. So I had some really front row um, access 
to some national politicians just as they were campaigning that way as a young reporter that was super cool um and then um you know i i got to a couple of weeks ago um go to the nfc championship game the 49ers versus the rams at sofi stadium and unfortunately of course we know that 49ers did not quite yes. make it. Um, but just to see the kind of the behind the scenes workings of an NFL game and to be in that beautiful stadium was really cool to cover that as a journalist. Um, you know, to even, uh, um, oh, this was really cool. This is probably one of my favorite stories. Um, I learned in 2020, I believe that Jimmy Stewart, you know, the famous Hollywood movie star from like the 50s, 60s, and for decades, right? You know, uh, yeah. it's a wonderful life. And um, uh, Mr. Shoot, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Oh my goodness. Oh, geez. Okay. <laughs> the wrong <laughs> person. We need your parents in the room. <laughs> I know, I know. So, so many uh, Harvey and all these great movies, um, uh, kind of like the Tom Hanks of his generation, you know? Um, yeah. But one, I mean, probably one of my very favorite movies is It's a Wonderful Life. And I learned that his daughter lives in davis california just half an hour no 20 20 25 minutes outside of, uh, sacramento you know where i live and work um she'd written an op-ed in the new york times and uh it was you know it was signed it, you know her name and then uh, davis california beneath it and i was like oh my gosh like i would love to reach out to her at some point and do an interview with her well flash forward to this past christmas 2021 and I learned it's the 75th anniversary of It's a Wonderful Life. And I thought, aha, here's my opportunity. Yeah. So um, I, I, you know, looked up a phone number uh, and reached out and she was gracious and said she'd be happy to give me an interview. And so just to, to pick her brain, and she was so generous with her time, to pick her brain about um, her father and, and um, to learn that he really was sort of that character from It's a Wonderful Life where, you know, he was very giving, he was very loving. Um, it was just, it was really a meaningful interview. Um, uh, yeah, and then finally, I guess I, there's just, there was another really fun one where this woman turned a hundred years old and she's like life goals. Like this woman turned a hundred years old <laughs> and a few months before her hundredth birthday, her daughter reached out to me and said, Hey, my mom is turning a hundred. And we, we have a lot of people who will reach out and say, you know, Hey, so-and-so is turning a hundred. Will you do a story? And, you know, we can't, I mean, that's, that's great. It's great that more and more people are healthy and living to a hundred, but we, you know, we can't cover every story, but she, something she said was so different. She said, my mom asked for her hundredth birthday, if we could throw her a parade and we have this marching band coming in and we're going to drive her down the cul-de-sac in a big red convertible. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is so cute. And so um, a photojournalist and I go that day and we interview her and she's just a hoot. I mean, she's so, she, <laughs> we said, you know, so what's, what's the secret to a long and happy life? And she was like drinking. And then she just like cracked herself up. I mean, she just was just a character. And um, yeah, it just, it was one of the most vibrant, fun stories um that i got to tell and that family just welcomed us and was so proud to tell the story of their beloved matriarch i mean that's really for me at the heart of it is um people trusting me with their stories whether it's good or bad or sad or you know whatever the case might be um trusting me to tell it and trusting me to tell it factually and, and well and meaningfully and then um if they're so kind as to give me feedback afterwards, we really loved it. We, you know, we all the family gathered in the living room to watch it. And that, that makes me feel, you know, even better. Oh, that's so great. How about turning it to the hardest story you've ever done as a journalist? Oh, wow. <clears throat> um, I guess I'll never forget how I felt in my first job when I interviewed the father of a soldier who'd been killed overseas. And, you know, without looking it up, I can't tell you exactly, I think it was in Afghanistan. I can tell you which province it was in and I can't tell you exactly what year it would have been sometime between I think 20, well, 2010 and 2014. That's when I was in um, Dubuque, Iowa in my first job. Um, but I remember they, I, one thing I've learned about telling tragic stories is that you would think that any family going through grief would say, why is a reporter here? Like turn them away. But time and time again, especially when the approach is compassionate and genuine, <clears throat> so these families want to share about their loved one. You know, and, and my, when I approach them, I always say, you know, 
I'm so sorry for your loss, genuinely. And if you don't want to talk with me, I will not bother you again. But I was wondering if you wanted to share any words about your loved one who you've lost. We would like to share some stories about who they were rather than just a statistic or a name. And we do that with, with homicide victims. We do that with, um, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's not just, um, you know, service members. It's, it's um, anyone that we can kind of humanize instead of just be, be a name or statistic. So anyhow, this, this father, they, they let me come to, I think it was, um, it might've been, yeah, I think it was the, uh, the memorial service or something. It was afterwards, they all gathered at the house and the father, you know, we were talking in a one-on-one -on -one interview. And I just remember this one moment where he doubled over in grief and he just held his sides and he convulsed with sobs. And as a young journalist, that was the first time I'd experienced, I think, grief that raw, especially mm -hmm. from a parent. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, th I knew enough in that moment just to, um, you know, be there and, and sit with him and, and let the moment play out. You know, um, one thing you learn in terms of good interviewing techniques is um, when someone's done talking, for example, um, I don't jump in right away and say, okay, well, what's the next question? Because sometimes in the silence, they'll fill it. And sometimes what they fill it with is the best soundbite of the interview. Um, and so in this case, not quite the same thing, but I knew just, 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 um, and at that point, of course, I wasn't like, oh, this is great TV. I was like, this man is in the depths of pain. And um, I don't know, I just, to be able there, to be there, to witness that, and ultimately to convey through this story that this is the cost of war. And this is Mm. Um, what these parents are going through and this is the sacrifice that these service members sign up to potentially make and that this one did make um that was i mean that was just it was honored an honor to be a vessel to convey that to the audience so anyway you talk about the hardest story i mean that's always a moment that will never leave me oh my gosh thank you for sharing that and the power i loved how you started which is this is how i felt hmm. Hmm. And the power of, you know, that, that Maya Angelou quote of people won't remember what you mm. said or what you did, but they'll remember how you, they made you feel. Mm. And I think about that related to you walking in with compassion and empathy to all of your interviews. And you just display that so beautifully. And I do believe that that is a big part of what makes you so good, not at your job, but not, I mean, at your job too, but as a human being as well. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, it's such a beautiful skill that goes both ways. Well, one one last official question that I have for you because I'm really curious and then uh, we'll move on to a couple of things before we wrap up. But what's the most unexpected thing that's happened to you in your life? Oh my gosh, in my life? Wow. <laughs> that's a big question, I know. So you can pick. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's good and bad answers to that. I mean, you know, and and I I I feel like sometimes the failures and the mistakes have yielded the best growth and the best, you know, um, lessons. Um, um, I mean, I would say certainly it, my best friend, Corey approached me in the fall of 2017 and said, Hey, um, I have been hired on as this host of this gay travel channel where we're going to go to these, um, like gay pride events all over the world and just kind of show, this this particular channel, it was YouTube channel and kind of a lifestyle brand. This particular channel was aimed at um, uh, gay men. So, you know, where can you travel in the world as a gay man where you can be safe and you can celebrate and have a fun time? Um, you know, because there are places in the world where you cannot safely travel if you are a gay man. Mm -hmm. And so he was one of the hosts of that show. And he said, we, we're looking for a video producer. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so- <laughs> Uh, it is a long and whirlwind story as to how uh, it all came together, but the, the short story is it came together, and during 2018, I got to travel the world with my best friend, mm -hmm. and we went, I mean, all over the world. We were in Sydney, Australia. We were in Brazil. We were in Israel. We were in uh, Spain and Mexico, and it was just, uh, it was um, amazing, um, and, and really just an opportunity to um 
yeah, kind of like with, it wasn't, it wasn't TV news journalism, but I still got to um, be a fly on the wall and help convey the joy and vibrancy of this culture. And um, that was such an honor and it was so much fun. And I'm so grateful to my um, uh, then boyfriend slash partner, now husband, because he held down the fort <laughs> while I was traveling and he watched the one dog that we had at the time. Now we have two. Um, yeah. But yeah, I was just, I was, I'm very grateful for that experience um, to be able to do that. So I think that was the most surprising thing to be able just to take a, a year to travel and um, yeah, basically with my best friend to the best gay parties all over the, <laughs> all over the globe. <laughs> Yes. And it, it always looked like you were having the best time ever. I was, I was jealous of you, even though I, I, I did my traveling in my twenties, but boy, yeah. that was so fun to witness. And that's such a good example of that phone call that comes out of the blue and it oh, could yeah. totally change the trajectory of your life, or at least a season in your life. Sure. And I love that Frank is so supportive of just, Hey, you go for it. I love yeah. it. That's a Couldn't lot. have done it without his support. He gave. Uh, he immediately was like, "You can't say no to this amazing opportunity." So I appreciate him. <laughs> That's super. Well, I so appreciate you being here, Becca. It's so fun to interview you and learn more about you personally as well as professionally. And I'm wondering if there's anything that I haven't asked that you want to answer or share. Oh, good question. Um, okay. Um, well, I have a question for you. Ooh, um, I was your, I was your first, uh, niece or, or niece, niece or nephew. I was the first born. Family, um, menu. Family. Oh, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll stop. Yeah, <laughs> oh, no. You go, go. Gotcha. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious what, um, what's one of your favorite memories of little, of little Becca? Oh, that's so easy. That's so easy. And I've told you this before. When when you were, I don't know how old you were, maybe three or something, and there were chocolates. We were in the in your parents' living room or in your living room at the time. And you weren't supposed to have any more chocolates. And yet you took your hand toward the candy dish and and we're just about to grab it, or actually, I think you did grab it. And maybe your parents or somebody said, Becca, like no candy. And then you, you, you slowly brought, you, you know, I shouldn't say slowly. You quickly gave it to me. Well, I was just giving that to our guests. <laughs> <laughs> you were very quick on your feet with that one. And it was hilarious. I thought that is the art of influence at an early <laughs> age. So yes, that was definitely one of my very, it was so cute and so funny. And also just reminded me of like looking at you now to think about this, this incredible powerhouse that you are. And I thought even at that, that small age, you, you knew what you were doing. You were very smart <laughs> and wise. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is so, that is such a fun memory. I'm, I'm not sure if you, I, and then I think you've told others, I don't know if I, I have heard that story before and I love that. Um, I would like to, and I, I appreciate the connection to who I am now. I'd like to think I'm a little less sneaky. I'm a little more, uh, honest in my dealings. Uh, but other than that, yes, a little, um, a little, uh, yeah. Uh, thinking on your toes. Can yes, I, so I was going to say, we, we can, <laughs> we can package it as the thing <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, where can people reach you, Becca? Yeah. So I'm um, across all social media platforms. It's at Becca, B-E-C-C-A reports. Like, like I'm a reporter, Becca reports on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I think I'm most active on Instagram and Twitter. So come check out, uh, photos and videos of my new dog, Scampy, and my old dog, Sweetie, and my husband, Frank, <laughs> and me. <laughs> I love it. Well, thanks so much for being here today. It's a pleasure to have this connection with you in a different way. Oh, so likewise. Different. I'm so honored you asked me. This was such a fun conversation. Thanks, Aunt Karen. Thanks. And that's a wrap of another episode of Ignite Your Confidence. I'm your host, Karen Laus. Thank you so much for listening. If you love today's episode, please subscribe and leave a review. It helps other people find the podcast faster, and it certainly helps me. If you're interested in more tips and tools around confidence, please join me over in my Facebook group called Ignite Your Confidence with Karen Laus. Remember, you too can stand out with unshakable confidence. <laughs>